and welcome to the part two um, of our interview with Susan Smith. In the first part, we talked specifically more about um, the actual county party and some stuff we had going on locally. However, in the second part of the interview, we kind of pivot um, and we ended the last part of the interview with asking Susan Smith what she thinks the word progressive means. Um, so we're going to kind of start there and then go on and talk about what's going on in the progressive community and progressives running in the primaries and kind of veer away to, to less party talk and more talk about what's going on in the progressive world. So thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy part two. What do you think the word progressive means? I think it means you stand for working people over the powerful, Mm -hmm. the rich and powerful. Mm. I think it means that you're going to work for the greater good, Mm. what's good for your community, Mm -hmm. and what benefits the many over the few. Mm. We love that Labor Party. (laughs) I want to use that on everything. So if you're if you're advocating for people with a lot of money in the business class, do you think that conflicts with a progressive ideology? Uh, yes, I think it. Well, I don't think it has to. Right. I don't think it has to. Mm-hmm. But I think it's. Um, I think we have to. We have to really back things up from where we were, uh, and I'm not even sure if this example is. Uh, is the right one to mm-hmm. use right now, but we were discussing it, mm-hmm. I guess, l- last night, my husband and I were. We were talking about creative loafing. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, David Warner was let go, Kate Bradshaw, because they got a new owner and they've cut staff. The mm-hmm. Tampa Bay Times has cut staff. Mm-hmm. Um, we used to have, and I guess I've gotten way off topic. I don't know what got me this, <laughs> but our newspapers used to be owned by super rich people, uh-huh. but they weren't money making right. enterprises. They were done for the greater good because they decided that it would, you know, that having an having an independent media. Mm-hmm was important for the concept of democracy. So you had, uh, they didn't make any money on it. They lost money on the newspapers, but they were willing to do it. Mm -hmm. I think we've lost that. uh, I think a lot of our super rich people don't have that interest in the common good. Mm -hmm. They are more interested in profits. Short-term profits are are everything Mm -hmm. and they they're literally draining the life out of our country Mm -hmm. and we've got to get more balance back in so it's okay to say you know we we don't want to totally lose corporate america Mm -hmm. we know that they do some good things Mm -hmm. but the balance has shifted some of them do (laughs) the balance has shifted so far in their direction Uh uh, that the working people have lost ground and lost ground and lost ground so i think um when you say corporate Mm -hmm. and rich and powerful it it doesn't have to be a bad thing, but it has become a bad thing because we've given them we've given them that power basically. Well, I think this and we is have a, to take it back. <laughs> I think this is another important thing that I had kind of an aha moment in reflecting on the past few weeks of just some things I've seen is that you know a lot of people you know have argued in favor of people with power for this kind of concept of self-preservation and even been like, you know, if if our party's not successful and, you know, if what's at stake at this point isn't just Democrats losing, it's kind of, you know, this, you know, republic fascism that threatens democracy in general. And, you know, these people, meaning people in power who might not be voting um, in favor of making the party better, but instead are voting to keep their power, like it hurts them you know, if they're voting against making making the party successful. But what I feel like is, does it really? I mean, not really, because in general, a lot of these people are privileged enough that they can survive Republican policies, that they might see, you know, other people's health care being lost or, you know, um, undocumented workers being forced to leave the country. But and it may not, you know, it may not be pleasant. But at the end of the day, you know, their lives aren't going to be that affected by Republican policy. So getting Democrats elected 
may be a benefit for their personal power, or it might be a benefit if they're a consultant or that, you know, but as far as like, does it really matter at the end of the day? I think it's, it's different when you have elected a officials or people in power whose actual lives changed on the policies than people who are just trying to be sympathetic for that. And I think that's part of a disconnect and a problem that we have isn't that there's not really a sense of self preservation in the people who hold a lot of power if their lives aren't directly affected by the policies. Well, I think this is where you have to go back to um, the fact that these are volunteer positions Mm -hmm. And people get engaged in politics for different reasons. Right. Um, DFA used to do... Democracy for America. Yeah, Democracy for America used to, in their trainings, mm-hmm. they did a whole section. Yeah, and I think trainings. I think Tim Heberlein just did this yesterday with the new oh, Leaders good. Council. Oh, good. Is that what he did? On uh, volunteer uh, recruitment and retainment and all about their so buckets and their I've well, taken that training. why are people in why are people coming to what's volunteer? their motivation what's their motivation yeah. is it social mm-hmm. because they want to be with their friends some's recognition is I, it recognition mm-hmm. is it they're lonely and bored right. is it they really are super committed to the medical marijuana issue mm-hmm. is it because uh, You've got to understand their motivation for being there, and yeah. then you can see, I think, part of why they're doing what they do. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people that get into those DNC spots mm-hmm. are, they've been at it for a long time, yeah. and they feel like it's their re- reward. Mm. And they do like the social aspect and the recognition part. They like to go to, you know, the cocktail parties and the. Yeah. Uh, and I saw that I was a delegate to the 2012 convention, mm-hmm. and you were were 16. you? Yeah. yeah, I was a Bernie. Delegate. And being a delegate was really special to be in that. In well, that wasn't world. when you were a Bernie delegate? Well, yeah. See, but, I was I was but, there during Obama's <laughs> second term, but to get to go to all those parties and mm-hmm. be considered special, that's a really that's a real. Uh, well, we didn't get invited. Uh, maybe parties, a boost. <laughs> well, they everybody was invited to the ones I went to. But still, uh, so I think you got a glimpse of what it's like for those people when they get to go to those national meetings. Right. And they're a Florida DNC member. I don't know if that's part of it because I've never been in that um, circle. that circle. And I know that... Um, Nancy Jacobson has, but mm-hmm. I know that Nancy was was there for the reasons you talk about. Right. Nancy was there to make the party better, mm-hmm. yeah, and she, she did when she was there. And she's um, so there. Is, there are people that are there to serve, um, and you know we have to hold them accountable, though. And it's just a shame that that accountability process is so convoluted and so... um, Easily abused? Easily (laughs) abused. Yeah, easily abused because of the way that it's written into our bylaws and to statute for electing them. Well, I mean, I think it speaks to a bigger a bigger issue is like we get as progressives, you know, working in the party, I get a lot of feedback of like, why isn't there more diversity in the progressive movement? You know, why aren't there more people of color? And, you know, and when I stop and think about it, because it's not for lack of trying or being on the right side of the issues or not wanting to empower any certain voice. I mean, you know, most progressives on the forefront of their issues is, you know, racial and, you know, um, economical justice and, and making sure we're one of, you know, the few people in the party I see really, really taking these issues and pushing them to the forefront is that, you know, it's a systemic problem. And it's the same systemic problem that we're trying to talk about that communities of color and, you know, low income, uh, or the the middle class, or, you know, people who don't have enough money to survive, don't have the luxury of participating, because this is a volunteer position, you know, that that their lives are so filled with just trying to survive, you know, whether you have five children because you weren't, you know, given access to birth control. And then you have one job and, you know, you're trying to survive. You don't have the luxury of going on a Wednesday to a Democratic meeting and having a say. So, I mean, part of the reason we don't have, you know, more of a diverse people, a group of people representing us is because of the systemic problems that we're fighting against that don't allow them the luxury of participating in this because daily life is so much more challenging and energy and, you know, conducive that 
Well, I don't want to say that because we've got some people in our caucus who are who are um, living in poverty, mm-hmm. and they have to in our caucus. In our caucus, they have they get scholarships mm-hmm. to attend our conferences. Right. They can't afford the membership, mm-hmm. you know, so they reach out and uh-huh. other people. Come, you know, other people donate. But so even just for bring, the time. Uh, the time factor is something, but if it's your interest, mm-hmm. and there, there again, I think, um, and I was told, don't use the word, uh, this came from, I guess, one of the, after the Parkland thing, we're not empowering, we don't have that ability, mm-hmm. we, People have to understand their own power. Mm-hmm. We have nothing to give the other people. Right. But I think if we can somehow um, show people how we use power or something, and those kids, I mean, those kids at Parkland, mm-hmm. the way they use their voices, I think, was a model um, and I know I got some flack for saying, too, their mm. message, the timing of that message, mm. I don't think it was just because of their privilege. Right. And that's the where and I disagree. That, <laughs> yeah. Well, the fact that they went hard after the NRA mm. and tied it to voting resonated at that moment in time. I mean, I think it was a lot of things, but I think that we can't take away the privilege. I think privilege was absolutely a part of it. Um, I mean, I think that, but there was, and I think that's the problem is when we have one issue is people always try to like singularity figure out like what are the causes of fact. I think that, privilege had to do with it but it was absolutely the timing and the strategy that it was all these things working together in a beautiful synchronicity that made it so powerful right but i think you can't dismiss the strategy of going after the nra the way no absolutely not and using their privilege to be able to do that because other and and one of the greater points i was trying to make and i think what frustrated me so much and it still frustrates me when i see the the sandy hook parents Mm -hmm. and the even the columbine Mm -hmm. they're not willing and they can't, mm-hmm. you know, it's just who they are, maybe. Mm-hmm. But they're not willing to go for the jugular. They're still trying to play that bipartisan, oh, um, But see, I disagree because I was involved with the Sandy Hook organization afterwards Mm -hmm. um, and following what they do. And I think that they did. I think the problem was, is at the time, people like, is it Alex Jones or InfoWars or whoever that guy was creating such a doubt and a conspiracy theory that their their anger didn't have as much much power at the time. That we were still kind of at this phase as a country that it's like it's improper, you know, to talk about at this time. You're turning tragedy into and that the timing wasn't right. But I feel like they have have testified against Congress and unsupported the NRA and rallied the people who are on their no, mailing list. No, I think they've been very hmm. moderate compared to what those kids in Parkland did. Okay. Those kids Fair in Parkland enough. went, they threatened to take them out of office, and well, they're the, still doing it. the difference it. Is, is those were actual victims, but the, too. Yeah, but the parents went with broken, you know, they were mm-hmm. broken-hearted parents who yeah. went in and pleaded for mercy. Sure. That's what they did. These kids didn't do that. Mm. They were taking hostages, <laughs> is what they did. With their and, privilege. And I was taught, well, it was with their privilege to vote, which we all have. So I think <laughs> it was their strategy of, no, seriously, yes. because they're just, and I think the fact that they had, and I think he was a Republican, their AP government teacher, or the, the government teacher, mm-hmm. that they had, they had just debated gun control. But I don't. So they had all this stuff. Right. So that was. But that could come from privilege too that they have those supportive teachers that are able to do that curriculum and they have the knowledge and they have the parents that back them up or if the fact that these were a primarily you know um urban or well that's mostly where that's also mostly where school shootings happen is in is in white schools by white people well mass school shootings i would say well that's what we're talking about though well, I think Sandy we need to Hook, be clear on Columbine, that. and yeah. Parkland were, and they were committed by, you know, white. Yeah, other than the Virginia Tech pri- one. Privileged. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, Virginia Tech was right. different. But I think something like 60% of mm-hmm. mass shooters are white um, men. They're all men. White men. Yes. Yeah. So I think all of it comes into play, but we got totally off topic <laughs> We here. did. I I'm forget gonna, where we were. I'm, that's but okay. But talking about engaging people in yes. the process. And I think, you know, this is when the time is right to engage people. Mm-hmm. I saw Candy Lowe at, uh, oh, I went yeah. to lunch the other day and ran Love into her. And she Lowe. said, you know, I did not know uh, that I was progressive till I, <laughs> <laughs> she <laughs> said all these issues. And I'm just now realizing that that's what a progressive I've is. I've had several come to, <laughs> Jesus progressive people have similar conversations with me. I, I think that's well, funny. and that's what we keep saying all along. Progre- <laughs> what does progressive mean? It means being a Democrat, really. Right. Well, like you said, past the 60s, past the yeah, 60s. Yeah, yeah. A modern day Democrat. <laughs> um, so I just want to touch on a few things. I don't know if we have time. Cut us off if you need to, <laughs> Uh But I want to talk about, so we're, we're focusing on progressives the frustration because after this week and after constantly kind of seeing in my mind, you know, just the manipulation at the the power that happens in the party and trying to fight against that. It's, it's exhausting. It's exhausting being a progressive in the party because you have the fight that you have on the forefront as a progressive trying to reform the party and bring change to people who don't want to change it and give up their power. And you're constantly battling that. But it's not as transparent because people aren't engaged in that part of it. So it's almost the silent fight that you, you, you go through that you can share with the people who are your allies, but people on the outside don't give you credit for. And then you have you know progressives working outside of the party who are so frustrated at the party, all they do is complain and attack you and you you know, call you not progressive enough, which, by the way, I don't care because I don't need anyone to validate my progressiveness. <laughs> um, which, if you're trying to do that, just stop. Because or my work <laughs> in the gun reform movement. Oh, Hello. Okay. Uh, I've been working in that one for a long time, and that was another. You thing have because you had a argument. personal story that you. I had. did, but I'm. I've been there forever. Yes. So when I can, people I can... come to me and start <laughs> criticizing me, <laughs> um, but so it's 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 like you're fighting two battles when you're a progressive in the party. You're trying to fight kind of the powers that be that don't want to change. And then you're kind of fighting all this misperception on the outside of progressives who, I mean, I think the newest term was puppy dog progressives. And we got told that we have the majority, you know, based on some poll nationally on what some issues that voters have and why aren't we acting like it? And, you know, is it just the fact that we're disorganized or we're lazy or it's, you know, you just, you, you start to lose any concept of the people who support you, you know, because you're fighting here and you're fighting there and you're getting attacked. And so, you know, as progressives working in the party, how, how are we to find that kind of motivation um, when nobody is able to necessarily appreciate the work that we're doing because it's not, you know, transparent. It's not brought to, you know, most people don't know what we're doing. How have you found, you know, the motivation to stay within the party and do the work that you're doing when it's so skewed and slandered and used against you and unappreciate, underappreciated? Like, how do you encourage people, to, progressives, to stay within the party? Because I'm struggling. Well, I think because I get... Um because I have seen some progress. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of it. Yeah. I think the fact that whatever my internal motivation is, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure what it is, <laughs> but to it's tell good. the truth. It's good, right? Well, some days it's not so good. <laughs> some days I just want to go shopping, as you know. Um, and then all of a sudden I get excited about something that's happened. Mm-hmm. I'm excited right now because we've got uh, you know, the there's this new Florida Progressives Pack mm. that I think if people will donate, Florida mm-hmm. Progressives Pack dot com, mm-hmm. I think it is, um, to help state and local candidates because mm. this infrastructure needs yes. to be built. Yes. And infrastructure doesn't get built overnight. Oh. And that's what we're trying to do. Right. We're trying to make a difference uh, with the legislature. We're mm-hmm. trying to make a difference with. Um, you know, locally, people who are working on issues, right. but this infrastructure piece, mm-hmm. training, and that's what I see I own doing so well in Hillsborough, mm-hmm. building this precinct infrastructure yeah. that we have not had, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, that kind of stuff excites me. And I know, you know, much <laughs> more than what's going on nationally. Right. Um, I think 
when people want to be trained and they want to learn, right. that kind of stuff excites me. Mm. And I guess that goes back to being a, a teacher, teacher. Yeah. and a parent. Mm-hmm. You know, you when you see that excitement right. from somebody, uh, when you understand that when we first started just the basic stuff, Statewide, mm-hmm. the Awake the State yeah. in 2011 after Rick Scott was elected. So we're elected. saying we? We, a group of progressives okay. around the state. <laughs> this was actually before, kind of before the um, the caucus was started, and we had this net roots group mm-hmm. that I was a part of. Yeah. And we used to go to the state because Karen Thurman was very open to this. I, I think I talked about it last time. Mm-hmm. But they would give us a room for a whole day to do training mm-hmm. on how to blog, mm-hmm. what's a blog, right. and try to teach these you know, old timers in the party, all this stuff. So we would have a full room of people because they right. were all, what is this newfangled thing <laughs> called a blog, you know? <laughs> and then we got to 2011 with Rick Scott. And for the first time, I think a lot of the more uh, establishment, mm-hmm. um, a lot of established people started to understand the power of social media. Right. And, we did a training at the library on a Saturday at Jimmy B. Keel, mm-hmm. and we had a room full of people. We had union members coming from Lakeland mm-hmm. to be trained on Facebook. Mm. And this was 2011. Yeah. And now, you know, people are so much more sophisticated mm-hmm. with all the social media tools, all the, you know, you see small counties doing things and younger people coming in and taking over. We still have the groups that, handwrite their membership list so somebody has to type them and you know we have to be very specific about the right. you know how to use some of the online tools but it, it's night and day from what it was six or seven years ago sure. and when you see that kind of progress it's right. a little thing but mm-hmm. um it it um it keeps you passionate it keeps you passionate yeah i guess what keeps me engaged is just fear if we don't if we're not engaged, what happens? Because I really believe when, you know, frustrated Democrats walk away from the party, you know, it's because the party has become what it has because people has di- have dif- disengaged that, mm-hmm. you know, when they say, oh, it's corrupt. Well, it's because we've allowed the corruption to happen through neglect of staying involved because, mm-hmm. you know, based on the, the structure of it, it actually can be democratic and it can be controlled by the majority, but we're never engaged enough to be the majority. So I just feel like every time I consider walking away, it's just handing the power back over to be abused and misused and that that's so dangerous. But on the other, the other scope, like I said, I mean, just constantly the sacrifice you make trying to, to balance that with the immediate progress that you see is, is very small and slim and it's hard to stay motivated. So I appreciate you kind of sharing the fact that, you know, there are so many people who want to learn and getting our gauge should be the motivation and not necessarily like the wins that we see um, on a daily basis. So uh, when Sally Boynton Brown was here for the training, she told me that she has a, uh, an affirmation wall. Mm-hmm. I think this would be helpful. I don't believe in all that. I mean, I <laughs> no, don't that, do that all that stuff. That wouldn't be helpful for me, but I understand but where no, you're going. But <laughs> no, it's a very simple thing. She said, every day I try to do put up a post-it note uh-huh. of one thing that I've done that's been successful. Right. And maybe it's, I got the drawer cleaned out. <laughs> Maybe Are it's you that stopping I me? sorted. <laughs> Maybe the, it said I sorted through the papers from that last training and got everything back in the file. But every day, I think it just keeps you from drowning. Right. If you can think of one single little thing you accomplished. I mean, I one, really just reorganized my drawer. Are you stalking me? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I get calls. This is another thing that's so uh, that feeds my ego, yeah. I guess. When candidates call me mm-hmm. and ask for help or mm-hmm. ask to, um, you know, they want to be directed to the people they should meet. Mm. And I understand that comes from my, you know, just Experience. being involved yeah. in knowing people. Mm-hmm. So you understand that um, you've become a connector. You can connect people. So there are little things like that you have to take as being as important as winning on the tax cut vote. Heather Booth, when she was here, Mm -hmm. who was phenomenal, said that she was uh, in charge of the strategy Mm -hmm. against Donald Trump's tax cuts. Uh 
that she was doing all right. that. You were. I'm not sure if you heard I her say. I this. didn't hear that part. Uh, she was in charge of whipping that vote uh -huh. and doing the overall strategy. She said, "We didn't win the vote, but we won that war, the mm. messaging war on mm -hmm. that, because now it's yeah. fixed in everybody's mind that this was a tax cut for the rich." Uh -huh. Think so. Yeah, so it's unless people see a huge change right, in their lives right. because of that tax mm -hmm. cut, it's going to be a loss for them. They're they're not even really running on it. Have you noticed? I can't so, even keep up with the what so, their strategy is. It's so insane. Yeah, at this so point. I don't even know how you work at the national <laughs> level, but she is such a phenomenal person. I hope that everybody will see that movie that gets oh an yeah. Opportunity What's the name of the movie again? Uh, Heather Booth. The woman? I think that's the website, I believe. I'm sorry um, I missed it. I'm glad I got to meet her. She was definitely a Shiro going forward. Well, I don't think anybody understands what she's done. Mm. Going back to the 60s when she went to Mississippi. Yeah, I had to, to really register. look up on Wikipedia to understand the impact that she's had. And her husband as well, who she oh, just yeah. recently lost. And I don't want to take away from no, that, no. but we are running out of time. Yeah, so yeah. There's just one more thing I want to ask you about. And then I want to kind of cover some things that are happening around town as well as our state conference that we're going to have because uh -huh. I think part of educating people is also letting them know where they can get engaged. Um, I always shy away from that because I don't want to look like I'm plugging things, but at the same time, it's like, don't give me all this information and then you no know, oh, asks yeah, or ways I can get involved. Yeah, you an action step at the end of everything. Um, I'm, I'm not always good about doing it. So question that's kind of off topic, but it, it still comes back to accountability to me. Um, and, and that's what thought this is focus about, being reflective, having accountability primaries okay we're seeing primaries are starting to happen and i'm starting to see so many of the kind of same fights about whether you know progressive primary challengers are good you know we've seen kind of this more recent thing where there was bob using and he dropped out of a race um because of janet cruz and you know fallback feedback from that about whether that was a good thing we're seeing a lot of people are disgruntled with bill nelson and you know is he going to have a primary challenger and since rick scott is going to be the candidate is that helpful or hurtful to him to take any air out of you know kind of this blue wave that we see coming so can you give me kind of your feedback on what you think about like progressives and primaries and all of that i think primaries are tend to be a good thing. We've got an issue with primaries in Florida because our primary comes so late. Mm. It comes the end of August, so it really uh, stymies our general election mm. candidate because they don't have a long time, a, a long to, time kind of to campaign. If it were in that. the first of May or right. you know when some of them are, that's a valid it would be point. Good. I never thought about that. Uh, so that's one of the issues. How do we change against that? it? Well, <laughs> you've got to talk to the state <laughs> legislature on that. <laughs> never one. mind. Never mind. <laughs> um, so that's one of the negatives uh -huh. about it. I think if you're going to have a primary, you have to have legitimate candidates. Uh -huh. And this is something that a lot of progressives don't understand. Right. And I know we've had this battle in our own, uh, on our own board. Mm -hmm. um, it's not enough to get in a race and be progressive. Mm -hmm. You have to actually run a campaign, yeah. raise money, mm -hmm. and Come up with a message, have a platform. Engage you have voters, to be a legitimate candidate. Sure. And you can't just put your name in the hat and expect everybody to flock mm -hmm. to you. Right. And that's what some of these candidates mm -hmm. have done. Okay. Now, uh, and I'm talking about Bill Nelson, for example. Mm -hmm. Nothing against the people, but you if you step into a statewide race yes. and have no base of support. You're not running a serious campaign. You're mm -hmm. just having fun or gotcha. something. I don't know what you're doing. Building uh, name recognition, building experience. Well, but you're not even doing that if you're not. Right. You know, so there, there are. You've got to have some legitimacy as a candidate. Okay. Um, on the other hand, I saw Alex Sink mm -hmm. when she ran for governor, yeah. and Alex didn't really have serious opposition, mm -hmm. so she never was forced to define mm -hmm. her herself her as a Democrat right. and her platform. Mm -hmm. She was only running at the state level right. against Rick Scott, so mm -hmm. it tended to be all about him right. and not, not about the Democratic which we, Party. Which could we, we're running the risk of now. Uh, well, you know, it, she was a new candidate, right. so that was a little okay. different. Um, 
I saw, and this was, I said it to him during our meeting in Orlando mm-hmm. last week, Darren Soto came to our meeting. Well, Darren Soto was not super progressive at all when he was in the state legislature. Mm-hmm. He's been great in Congress. Mm. He had a serious primary, I think, with um, Susanna Randolph mm-hmm. and Dina um, Dina Grayson. Mm-hmm. Oh, but okay. Darren was forced to run, to define his values. Yes. He had values, and mm-hmm. he was forced to define them, and now he's serving. And now you can hold him accountable under, for it. You can it. hold him accountable for it. So I think in that case, it made Darren a much better congressman that he had the primary. So can I give you what I'm hearing? Mm-hmm. This translates to me that you're supportive of primary uh, progressives uh, challenging in primaries, as long as they have a solid, real campaign, because if it's an actual, you know, campaign that's going to force their candidate to feel challenged, that it also helps them, you know, outline a platform and take a stance on the issues so that, you know, they can engage people who feel passionate about those issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So you're yeah. supportive as long as they're just serious candidates. Yeah. Strong, serious but, candidates. But don't just throw your name in the hat. And embarrass us. What do you think about the, <laughs> Is that? I, that might the, be too harsh. <laughs> well, first of all, who are you talking to, Amy? I don't I'm think you can be about, too harsh. <laughs> no, yeah, true, true. Uh, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you are. I don't know. I can't speak to that. I'm kind of no, harsh I'm myself. No, t- I'm thinking of... Well, what do you think about have, the Bob Using thing? Do you have any feedback on that? I've I'm seen that not, being very polarizing. I'm not happy about You're not that happy race. about him leaving the race. Right. Okay. Um, I encouraged Bob to run. Yeah. I was a host on his at his first cam, his first fundraiser. Mm-hmm. I think he's a phenomenal person. Yeah. Uh, I don't think uh, Janet Cruz needed to get into that race. She was going to run for county commission. Somebody mm-hmm. else didn't run for that, so mm-hmm. that she could run right. for it. I just don't know why we had that um, upheaval. And he already had name recognition. He had run in that race before and had only lost by a small, small percentage mm-hmm. of um, the votes, which some people might mm-hmm. blame. I it think for this Redmond. might be a case of the consultant class oh. getting involved and not. I, I I don't think it was the Democratic Party. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. So do you do you wish Bob would have just stayed in the race? I told him to like two weeks ago, but <laughs> so do you think he, he would have? Do you think he would have won that race? I think we would have had a good primary, ah. a good. Um, well, I good. would love to invite Bob on to uh, the show because um, I did see him this week, and it sounded like he was trying to figure out a way to compose his thoughts so that he could kind of get his message out of why he chose and what he was thinking um, on a broad platform. So, um, we well, love and Bob. let me just say also that yes. I think Bob and Janet are progressive. Right. I don't think this is about who's progressive and sure. who's not. Yeah, it was just the fact there was that already a good candidate. In there the was race. already a good candidate in the race, and I'm not sure why. Another one needed to come Another in. Another one needed to come in. Um, okay, so here are some of the things that I want to talk about that are going on. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, just to do a small recap last night about the Spring Fling, which is a fundraiser the Democratic Party hosts every um, year. It was a lot of fun. Um, the logistics could have been planned better. There was a an overwhelming response, um, and I don't think the room was big enough as far as capacity, and there were a lot of people who couldn't fit in. So, I mean, it's good that we have that much engagement, but we definitely need to think about those things going forward. But the goal is to raise money, and I think that's what we did. So hopefully we can definitely help our candidates. And I had a great time. I went to the Andrew Leonard uh little kind of after party and uh, just to see the diversity in that room and people supporting each other and the conversations that were had that was a I was really glad I got to attend that but um so do you know about the May Day event that's coming up on on March 1st it's on my calendar I got a message from um I think from Chris Regalado sent me a message. So yeah, that's that's um, a labor. That's a labor, labor event day. that mm-hmm. to support the labor movement. That's why we have May. May that's f- the real labor day. <laughs> that's the real labor day <laughs> is to actually support the labor unions that help to fight to make sure that we had some regulations in our in our work uh, in our uh, businesses to support workers. And they're planning a really interesting kind of march. I think from Curtis Hickson down to Ebor. I think that starts at five p.m. I think it's a Tuesday, May first. 
so I, I really hope people show up and support that. I went last year. It was a lot of fun. It was really educational. Um, you know, I think that as progressives, we absolutely have to be supporting our labor unions. And, you know, I mean, that's that's the key to the working class right there. Um, and so I want to go ahead and give a shout out for that. Um, I think that you can find the organizing efforts for that on Facebook or at different groups. I'm not sure if they have a centralized location. Um, and I also want to talk about the state conference that the that that we're organizing. So tell me about the state uh, conference happening in May and the details of that. Yes. Yeah, so we're having our conference in Gainesville at the University of Florida. I think the physics building, mm -hmm. we pinned down that location. Uh, May 18th, 19th, and 20th, okay. uh, we have a host hotel. The deadline to book your rooms is next Friday, so we've got to get people uh, into those rooms. Our room is booked. Uh, at the Wyndham <laughs> Garden. Okay is the hotel okay. in Gainesville. Uh, on Friday night, the PAC that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. the Florida Progressives PAC, yeah. will host a um, candidate mixer, Ooh. and it's $25 minimum donation. It's a fundraiser for the PAC, okay. and there will be some appetizers. It's at the First Magnitude Brewery, I believe. Okay. Uh, and that'll be 6.30 to 8.30 to kind of welcome people to town and mm -hmm. let people socialize. I went to the one last year. It was fun. Yes, it was. <laughs> it was fun. A lot bigger than we thought it would be. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then Saturday we'll start. Well, if you're staying at the Wyndham, we are. I plan to do a champagne toast in my room about 6.30 for the royal wedding. Oh, that's right. Bring my your goodness. tiaras <laughs> because you have to be dressed appropriately. <laughs> and then the conference is at 8.30, starting at 8.30. Uh -huh. And we'll have our business meeting in the morning, and then the and that's free. Okay. The conference is 30 for members, 40 for non-members. So if you join... Mm -hmm. You save ten dollars. Wow! Uh, and it, we have a student rate mm. also for that. So if anybody's interested, let me know. If you need a scholarship, let me know. And we have uh, Beth Becker, who's one of the leading digital strategists in the country, Ooh. is coming in to help us with digital, and she'll have the latest on Facebook and what's going Sounds on. So with progressive. I know, right? <laughs> and uh, Beth has trained for the new Leaders Council for the Labor Unions for Progressive Congress. Okay. So she's got quite a history, wow. and quite a resume. And then we have Tom Sullivan coming mm -hmm. down from North Carolina. Tom is uh, a writer at the blog Hullabaloo, mm. Digby's Hullabaloo, which is one of the leading progressive blogs. And he is a Democratic Party activist in Asheville, North Carolina. Oh. And when, in 2014, when everything in the country was lost, mm -hmm. they won seats uh, mm. in their area. So he's got a, an online training manual. And he does basic get out the vote mm. is what Tom's going to train in. And then we have uh, Wes Jones, who's from Gainesville, who's going to talk about field organizing, I believe, and uh, a woman from Tampa named Annie, and I don't have her last name. I've never met her. Somebody else got her for so this. So this is a place to uh, be for progressives. This is a place, but we also have, I, I'm excited to announce, we're having a dinner that night at the hotel. It's $50 for that, uh -huh. uh, which is good for a hotel meal, y'all. And uh, <laughs> all. Gloria Totten from... Um, the Public Leadership Institute is going to be our speaker, and Gloria has asked to do training also. So we're going to have her doing some training. So wait, let me get this straight. You're going to spend a majority of time actually training people? We're training people. And then why, on... Why would you do that? I know. Because they're going to crazy. work? You expect people to work? Yes, and Michael Caldron's going to do something. i got to get all this in. Okay, Michael okay. is going to do a session on... Uh, you know, how to protect your websites and just oh, basic right. security, security. Uh, password security and all those things. Uh, anyway, we'll repeat some sessions on Sunday. We're very excited to have Anna Escamani and Carlos oh, Smith doing sessions. Oh, that's exciting. Two of our state progressive Woo! champions. Carlos is in the legislature now, and Anna is, we or she's going to win. She's sure, gonna win. she's going to win and be in the legislature. She's so uh, that's her. a you can find out about it. It's now on our website, uh, progressivefl.org. Okay. You can go there and get the link to Eventbrite to register. Please register soon. And also, something I haven't given enough publicity to, mm -hmm. 
We're going to allow resolutions. Oh. We're going to be updating our platform and our bylaws, and oh. those will be sent out in the next couple of weeks for uh, the members to go over. But we're accepting resolutions, and we've already got one on uh, D.C. statehood that we're going to Wow. So be, does that, that mean like if you don't feel like progressives are going in the right direction or you don't like that you have an option to like put forth some some direction that you'd if like to you see? would like to see the progressive caucus take a step uh-huh. as long as it's in alignment with our platform right. um, we will hear your resolution the platform committee will do the initial but that's may 1st is the deadline okay so anybody and i've got a format i want it in the exact format Did we do this last year? No, we didn't. Okay. We did have one resolution that mm-hmm. was offered on the uh, Aramis. So this is kind Ayala. of a model of what we did at the state conference as well when they did the resolutions? Yes, okay. yes. Very simple resolutions. I've got the format. I'll send it out to anybody. And I know I got a call from uh, one of your – from Bo. Oh, Robichaud. He's He wants <laughs> to do a resolution on guaranteed <laughs> income. Oh, yeah, uh, he just did a lot of, like, income equality training, and he's very fired up. So he's writing his resolution now. <laughs> so if the platform committee approves it, that Love will that. be another one, because that goes along with our platform. Also. So for all of you who sit out there and criticize that you don't necessarily think progressives are fighting for the issues that you want, here is yet another opportunity for you to have some input in that and be engaged by doing some work and by... <laughs> Uh, submitting and advocating for the issues that you feel like we should be supporting. So you are invited to help shape and have some say in our platform and what we're going to fight for. So if, if you feel passionate about that, please take advantage of that. Um, and so I hate to kind of volley back to this, but I totally forgot that I asked for questions from our listening, our listening audience. <laughs> so let's however many there are. Um, <laughs> One of our um, members, Russ G, wanted to ask you specifically, Susan, and this might do some backtracking, even though we'd gotten in another direction. How can progressive de- Democrats trust our state party if they continue to ignore our opinions or even on issues that we voted upon or approved? For example, the weighted vote. Um, but I think he's trying to say, you know, kind of similar to my question, how do we have confidence that uh, we're valued in our party when that's not the message that we're getting? I think you don't look for affirmation from your party. Mm. I think you yeah. do your own thing oh. and you do your work on the ground uh-huh. because there's plenty of work to be done. That's an understatement. If you're willing to do it, then you do the work at your local level mm-hmm. or you do it in the state caucus mm-hmm. because that's what we're doing. We're mm. carrying on mm. and doing what our mission is. Yeah, you're and, always focused like that. And we're going to fight. You know, our job is to keep progressives engaged, mm-hmm. and that's what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Um, so fight, fight, do the work, fight. do the fight. Do the work. So, so what do you think about this blue wave then? Because this is something I meant to say and I didn't. I'm really worried by the reliance on this backlash from Trump as this giant blue wave and that there's going to be so many outraged Democrats and even Republicans showing up because of the policies. We're going to win by landslides and we're going to get every single Democrat we have elected. And one, I worry if that's true because I see a lot of people not doing the work that they should be doing because they're counting on this blue wave. And two, even if that is successful in this one election, again, if it, we're not building the infrastructure to keep these voters engaged as, and I know you've said this, as an alternative to just an outrage to bad Republican policies, but if we're not giving them reasons to stay engaged for good policies that we're fighting for, how sustainable is that? So what's your feelings real quick on this blue wave? I think the the electorate, I've said this since the day after the election in mm-hmm. 2016, the electorate is so unpredictable. Yes. And it's so from one day to the next. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But I don't think we're just resting on the blue wave mm-hmm. uh, concept yeah. or whatever. Because I go to the DEC meeting yeah. and I see standing room only. Mm-hmm. And those are people, for the most part, that are there to work their precincts mm-hmm. and, and do the work. Mm-hmm. Many more people than we've normally seen involved. Uh, I go to Hernando County Mm -hmm. and I see 90 people at a club meeting. Mm -hmm. 
Um, every meeting I go to, mm-hmm. I see phenomenal crowds mm-hmm. of people who are interested and engaged. Mm-hmm. So something, you know, there's something going on. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen with the kids in Parkland. Mm-hmm. But I know that when they had the walkout the other day, yeah. they were registering voters mm-hmm. everywhere they went. Mm-hmm. They're not just talking. Right. They're, they're taking action to change things. So that's. So we still need to do the work. The work right? has to be done. Yeah, to there's get out no. There. Yeah, you we don't still need just, a canvas. Yeah. We still need a phone bank. We still need to find candidates that we want to work for and get their message out. We still need to grassroots organize. We still need to do the work. We can't rely on this blue wave to oversweep us exactly. of laziness, right? And I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention those uh, amendments that are going to be on the ballot. Oh because yeah, we're that do a is whole meeting a huge, on that. Huge, huge thing, and we will vote on that at our conference too. Okay. We will. I'll have a summary, and we're going to go over those amendments because I want our caucus to be educated, to be educated, and to have a vote. In so the, you mean the, co- the 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 amendments that are going to be on the election ballot that will change and shape either our constitution or what's going on? You mean the yes. the amendments that everyone will vote? So vote it's on. not just about who we're electing in the fall. Mm-hmm. We cannot allow our constitution right. to be changed for the worse. Right. Which, which is the whole couple, reason. This there are a couple of good ones, but there are original. way more bad ones that are going to be on the ballot and mm. they're going to be 13. Mm. So it's going to, that's why we want everybody to vote by mail. So they ha- can call you or me mm-hmm. or, um, cause I get the sample ballot or, or somebody like and find out what the democratic party recommends. Right. I don't know if the state party is going to take a position. Interesting. Um, uh, but we will take a position. Our caucus will mm-hmm. take a position, and we're going to have a palm card made up that we'll hand out everywhere. Well, so. our local caucus, the Tampa Bay, the Democratic Progressive Tampa Bay, um, is going to do a whole meeting on those amendments to Good. educate our members. So we'll try to follow up with that. And also, I meant to say that this Thursday, which is the 26th, I believe, um, we're going to be having a meeting on medical marijuana and discussing that and also talking about how, you know, the laws affect kind of, you know, the the classism in our society and, you know, who our laws have hurt and, you know, what that talks about now, the systemic problems that we have um, because of our drug laws. Um, but Joe Redner is going to be there. Um, we have Chris Kano who's going to be doing a really informative thing. So I do want to let members know that at the Seminole Heights Library at uh, 7 p.m. on Thursday, the last Thursday of every month we have our meetings and this one is going to be a good one um, where you can come and talk to Joe Redner and find out about medical marijuana but also that we will be having a meeting coming up on those amendments where people can get educated and in closing I have a strange um, thing I wanted to kind of get your opinion back did you see these Nazi protests they had up in Georgia I believe on because of Hitler's birthday and that a bunch of counter protesters were arrested because of that they had masks on as they were counter protesting and the the police arrested all the counter protesters as opposed to the Nazis burning um swastikas you know it, in front of everyone and that um, there actually is a fund. I, I couldn't remember the name because I ran in here so fast on Facebook to provide the uh, legal uh, expenses for some of these counter protesters who got arrested. But have you seen any of that coverage? I have not that seen that coverage, I will say. But, you know, Florida passed a law mm-hmm. um, this year. Mm-hmm. It was included in the higher education bill. So <laughs> it, it was it was a free speech uh-huh. bill. And it was supposed to, it, w- it was killed in the Senate. Mm. And the last week of session, they it was a zombie bill. Mm. They b- brought it back and attached it to the higher ed bill, mm. and it went through. So mm. what this bill would do mm-hmm. is punish universities that allow counter-protesters mm. in the name of free speech. It would hold them financially liable to mm. the speaker. And it all came about because of the white nationalist uh, who was speaking at the University of Florida last mm-hmm. year because the counter-protesters drowned him out. So they're going to punish the universities. Mm. If that happens. So it's a right wing uh, idea so that this white nationalism can be 
I think, can ha- be given a voice in this country, and it's dangerous. Yeah. Uh, so I think counter-protesters also have a right to free speech. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we unfortunately, we're living in times where people are going to have to get involved in civil disobedience. Mm. Do you Do you think that as a state we're more racist than not? Oh, I think we've got so much institutional racism in our country. Do you think that is possible that an African American gubernatorial candidate could win Florida? I think Barack Obama won Florida twice. So yes, I think it's possible. So I, I had a conversation with somebody last night and a Democrat who I think is a very progressive Democrat said, but he's half he was half white. Do you think that would play into no. it? That's a that they you know, whichever argument they wanna back up, I, no. I that's an argument made by somebody who doesn't want to support African American candidates. You think? Because that's that, I hear a lot of that pushback, and I start to wonder. Like, I mean, maybe we're a racist state as far as the people who have been the most vocal and the most active. But I mean, I wonder, and I think it's a good question to kind of leave on. Like, as far as voters, what our diversity looks like, and if we had candidates that reflected more diversity, if if instead of saying, "Oh, we could never win because of this racist state," that maybe it would show that you know, we have a stronger majority of people that have just been waited to see themselves reflected in our candidates. Um, uh, you know, I'm torn because yes. I would love to see a woman mm-hmm. elected president or governor, right. but I put the values mm-hmm. ahead of, I, tr- I like to think I put the values. What do you think most average voters do? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. So maybe that's a good question for another podcast. I think it could be because... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if that's what we're looking for in a candidate right. necessarily. Why would we elect Donald Trump as our president in this country if Well, I think were we that looking I did we see ourselves as, you know, thugs from I think the people who showed out to the polls real estate thugs. I think the people who showed up to the polls to vote were these uh groups of hate groups that who had, who had been uninvolved in politics for so long and that nobody really knew that they exist or that they were voting blocks and that, yeah, they saw Donald Trump speaking to uh, their racism and their code words and their dog whistles and they finally found a candidate that reflected them and inspired them to organize enough to show up as this un expected force at the polls i i mean i worked but i don't polls. think they were voting for him because he was a man or because i think they were but i, I think mean, they were he reflected something in them that they hadn't seen yeah in any absolutely other yes. absolutely but that's not the same thing as saying identifying with a racial or a, a gender thing well no i mean that's not true. that there were so not right. that there weren't people who I agree. were opposed to hillary because she was a woman because those exist sure but I, well, um, I think I mean not reflected just because they look like them, but because they have the lived experience to speak to the issues in a way that other candidates don't. Right. So I, I guess that clarification. But reflected, then that. But see, that's where I think uh, it would help, mm-hmm. not because somebody is a certain a certain race, identity. but because they're because what, they're they can their advocate that for that yeah. that group more mm-hmm. so because they have the mm-hmm. lived experience as opposed mm-hmm. to you know getting the information from someone else. Yeah. So again, uh, just in that few minutes, we had a lot of, of <laughs> we could interesting <laughs> conversations. So we'll save that for another podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much again for coming out um, and giving me your feedback. I hope going forward, you know, we'll be able to talk with a lot of different members of our community about a lot of different issues. Again, I'm imploring you if you like what you hear, but uh, there are some things that you would like uh, me to focus on or things in, in our community that you think are impactful that people need to know about or we need to talk about. Um, you can you can email me, jvon30 at gmail.com um, or you can get a hold of me on Facebook or you can like and follow our podcast both on Facebook or by telling your friends where to find us at um, reclaimingmymind.org. Um, Susan, is there any information that you want to give out in case people need to get in touch with you? Uh, you can email me at president mm-hmm. at progressivefl.org. Okay. Um, I'm always on Facebook. Come <laughs> find me there. I don't, 
hide from people. <laughs> Not oh. many people. <laughs> oh, that was another thing. One of our DNC members blocked a bunch of people on Facebook. So when they were giving out all this information, it was impossible to give the other side of anything or give any other narrative because you couldn't see the conversation to begin with. What do you think about blocking people when you're when you're arguing do you think that's a fair tactic to block a whole group of people uh, no uh, no but i have different ideas on blocking i don't i think i've only ever blocked two people right so i because i believe in letting people hash things out oh, there are times you sure do there's <laughs> only been maybe one or well a couple of times that i've deleted conversations when somebody got nasty abusive to, when yeah. they got abusive to a that's person that's right that's where you have on, to kind of draw the line personalities yes. but when it comes to debating the issues yeah. or have at it right Right. I'm uh, not going to. I think if somebody's deleting that. a whole group of people because they're afraid of the narrative, that that says a lot. But that's just me. Um, so we're going to go ahead and close with that. <laughs> Thanks again for coming out here. Thank you. If you've listened to this entire podcast, I know they're extremely long. Um, and thanks for all the feedback we got. Um, so I appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.